Okay, so thank you. Can everyone hear me? Is this okay? Can everyone hear me in the back? Yes? All right, very good. So the title I was given was Non-Coding RNA Targeting Therapies. And of course, this is uh, talking about non-coding RNAs. It already hints at molecular biology. And since you're such a diverse audience, I decided to uh, step down one step and first start with, the, uh, with some general molecular biology stuff. And then we'll dive a bit deeper into it. And there will be some therapy um, uh, related work in the end, but it's it's mainly molecular biology 101, and I just want you to uh, go away from my presentation today uh, with uh, the feeling that you know what non-coding RNAs are, actually, okay? Um, and since this is a summer school, we'll try to do it a little bit more interactive, so it's also a bit of a change to previous speakers. I don't know how it was yesterday, but at least this morning uh, it was a little bit like conference style. I will uh, try to do it a little bit more interactive. So, um, this is the picture that everyone remembers from high school biology, so I don't have to explain this um, very uh, much. Let's see if I can get this po uh, pointing with my finger on this screen to work. Um, so um, in, the, in the nucleus there is uh, DNA, uh, which is in chromosomes, and this gets uh, transcribed into RNA by RNA polymerase, and this RNA, in this case a messenger RNA, then leaves the nucleus, and it is recognized by ribosomes, uh, which translate this messenger RNA into uh, a protein, which is over here. And this is termed the central dogma in biology. I hate that term, so I will not use it again after this time. Uh, but D DNA is basically transcribed to RNA, which is translated into protein. Everyone knows this, right? And proteins, in the end, are things that do stuff in the cell. All right? Um, but actually, this picture is not correct. Or it is correct, but not always true. Um, so there are RNAs which do not get translated into protein. And actually on this slide, there's already two examples of those. And maybe someone in the audience can point out at least one of them. So this is the time to, to say something, preferably the students. Do I see it? tRNA, perfect. So these are tRNAs, transfer RNAs, that actually make sure that the right uh, amino acid, these small balls, is attached um, to the to the new protein based on this uh, this codon, this triplet in the RNA, uh, in the messenger RNA. So these are RNA molecules that function as an RNA molecule without being translated into a protein. All right, so non-coding RNAs. Uh, and there's actually another hidden example in here. Maybe someone else has an idea. It's a little bit more difficult one. So I uh, hear rRNA. So in these ribosomes, there are ribosomal RNAs. And actually, ribosomes are, are made up of a lot of RNA. And these are also just RNA molecules that are in the ribosome that are required to translate uh, messenger RNAs into protein. All right, so there are definitely RNAs in the cell that do not get translated into protein. And they are important, as, uh, in this case, even important to actually translate RNA into protein. All right, so we've spoken now about these uh, tRNAs, transfer RNAs. They, they look like this, and they make sure that, uh, that when they recognize a, a certain triplet in mRNAs, that the right amino acid is attached to the nascent protein. Uh, and we've also spoken about uh, rRNAs, uh, and what you can see here is basically a, a space-filling model of a ribosome. Um, and the colors are maybe a little bit difficult to see, but you see this this sort of uh, double uh, DNA, double helix uh, structure, which is actually RNA in the ribosome. And you see this structure, which is um, like an alpha helix of protein. So that color is basically the protein in the, uh, in the ribosome. And in yellow, you can see an, an actual tRNA uh, in the ribosome. So what you should see in this picture is that when you just look at it, most of it is actually RNA. or it looks as though most of it is RNA, and only, say, a half of it is actually protein. So ribosomes <laughs> actually are mainly RNA, and these are functional RNAs. Again, uh, indicating that RNA can also be functional without being translated into a protein. Um, so, and when you look at the genome, so basically DNA, if you then look what gets transcribed into RNA, and the so-called transcriptome, it's about 80%. Um, so of all the base pairs that we have in our, our genome, about 80% is transcribed into RNA. But of those RNAs, actually only 3% actually code for protein. So these are those codons and those triplets in mRNAs. And all of the other RNAs actually non-coding or not translated at least. So these can be the introns from mRNAs. These can be the rRNAs, the tRNAs, uh, any RNA that actually does not get translated into protein. And actually what is interesting is that the more complex an organism gets, 
um, the more non-coding RNA uh, exists in that organism. So you can see bacteria have very little uh, non-coding RNAs, and in humans, as I said, up to 97% of the RNA is actually not coding for protein. And that's why most people are now interested in RNA, or at least I think most people are interested in RNA. Um, so these non-coding these non RNAs can be uh, roughly divided into small ones and long ones. This is a very uh, rough way to divide it, but anyway. Uh, and on the small non-coding RNA side, so shorter than 200 nucleotides, the main, um, uh, the most well-known categories, microRNAs. I've seen them coming uh, by on, on, two, uh, on the slides of both presentations tomorrow already, so you have seen that already, but I will go into detail how these things work. Um, and these are endogenously processed by endonucleases, as I will tell you, and their sequence is um, relatively well conserved. When you then look at the longer non-coding RNAs, and I use as an example the class of link RNAs, so this is basically just the abbreviation of long non-coding RNA, or LNC RNA, which I will call link RNA. There's also the term LINC RNA, <laughs> but this is basically the same. So I will just say link RNAs, and then you know it's long non-coding RNAs. Anyway, these are more than 200 nucleotides. Um, usually they are 5 prime cap polyadenylated and spliced, like any normal mRNA, if you remember from your molecular biology classes. Uh, however, for these non-coding RNAs, the sequence is relatively poor conserved between species. Uh, but it doesn't mean that the function is not, because if they fold in the same manner, and if the 3D structure of these RNAs is the same, then the sequence can be different, but they can still bind perhaps the same proteins or perform the same functions. Um, and of the microRNAs, there's only about uh, 2,000 described, a little bit more than 2,000 in humans. But uh, there's even more than 30,000 link RNAs described until now. So there are even more than protein coding genes or around the same uh, ballpark figure. So uh, indicating that these may also be just as important as protein coding genes. Um, this is not something from basically the last decade, uh, but at least in the last decades, uh, more and more people have been looking at it. Uh, but these non-coding RNAs have already been identified very early on. When in 1989, uh, the first known uh, non-coding RNA was discovered, which is called uh, H19. And actually, this also has a role in the cardiovascular system. Um, so this was already a long time ago, and they discovered, OK, this is an RNA, but it does not get translated into protein. And they found it actually functions as an RNA. The microRNAs are discovered a little, a, a little bit more recently, uh, in 1993, and uh, these were discovered. And since that uh, time, uh, as you can see, many other types of uh, RNAs or non-coding RNAs have been uh, discovered and, and studied by, by people, um, including myself. Um, so let's go a little bit into detail into these uh, microRNAs, so the small uh, non-coding RNAs that are usually about 20 nucleotides in size, so that's quite uh, in size, so that's quite small. Um, as you can see up here in the, in the nucleus, they are, of course, just encoded in the genome, um, and they can be anywhere in the genome, basically. So they can be intergenic, meaning that they are somewhere in between protein-coding genes or non-coding genes or whatever. They can also be intronic, meaning that they are within an intron of, for example, a messenger RNA, and that they are processed from this intron, um, they can also be polycystronic, meaning that in one transcript there's multiple copies of several micro microRNAs in uh, this RNA, as you can see here. So um, these uh, microRNAs are, uh, when they are uh, transcribed, they form this cool hairpin structure, which is called uh, the primary microRNA. Okay, so this is the transcript that comes from the DNA after RNA polymerase makes it. Um, and then it has this hairpin structure, and if, if it's polycystronic, there's multiple of these hairpin structures in the same molecule. Um, and this hairpin structure is recognized by an enzyme called drosia, which is in the nucleus, and which basically cleaves off this hairpin structure from the rest. So then you just have this hairpin structure left. This is then recognized by an, a protein called exportin, <laughs> because it exports it, uh, exports these um, uh, hairpin structures into the cytoplasm. Um, where they are then recognized by an enzyme called dicer. And this uh, dices basically the, uh, the loop of this hairpin off so that you get a double-stranded uh, RNA molecule. And this sort of bulge that you see in the middle is depicted because they are not always 100% complementary to each other. Um, but you do get uh, a double-stranded sort of 20-nucleotide structure in the end. Um, that is uh, the product of, an en of this enzyme called uh, dicer. 
And of course, this can be the case for many different microRNAs. Um, and this is then called the so-called microRNA, microRNA star duplex. So one of the strands is called micro, the microRNA, the mature microRNA, and the other strand is called uh, the star strand. So if you ever see this annotation, then you just know that they, are, uh, that they come from the other strand. And which one of the strands is called the mature microRNA and which one is called the star is basically uh, uh, determined for every single microRNA uh, separately based on the abundance in cells. So that goes a bit too deep, but uh, I w so I won't touch on that. But then uh, when Dyson made this uh, double-stranded uh, microRNA uh, molecule, this is uh, recognized by an uh, enzyme complex called RISC, RNA-induced cytosine complex, where only one of these strands is incorporated, so this is important. Um, so only one of these uh, strands, so the mature microRNA as a single strand, a 20 nucleotide molecule finally is incorporated into this RNA-induced silencing complex, which contains, amongst others, proteins called argonaut. Maybe you've heard of it, AGO2 in, in humans. Um, and this, um, this complex can then actually bind to uh, other RNAs. And this is the whole function of microRNAs, to bind to other RNAs, and of course mostly messenger RNAs. And when they bind to the to messenger RNAs, and usually actually this is in the three prime UTR, so in the untranslated region of my, of messenger RNAs, but it can also be within the open reading frame. Uh, when these microRNAs bind to the uh, messenger RNA, they either prevent the messenger RNA from being translated into protein, so they block uh, translation into protein without affecting the mRNA levels, or it induces degradation of the mRNA, which actually then, of course, reduces the mRNA levels and thereby reduces protein. Or it can be a combination of both. Some microRNAs have been shown to do both. Um, and this can also depend on which microRNA it is and which cell type and on which target mRNA, for example. So this is very complex. But the, the take-home uh, message of this part is that microRNAs always inhibit gene expression. All right? So they bind to mRNAs and they inhibit the expression of those mRNAs. And these microRNAs are very short, only 20 nucleotides, but even 20 nucleotides can be unique in the genome, right? Um, but these microRNAs only bind parti partially complementary uh, to target mRNAs. So only about seven nucleotides of the microRNA actually determines where it binds, because there it's 100% complementary. And therefore, one microRNA can have over 100 target genes, because these seven nucleotides just by chance uh, occur a lot in the genome, right? or in, 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 in the transcriptome in this case, because that's important. Um, now, uh, why is this uh, important in cardiovascular biology? Uh, so here's an example from vascular biology. I'm a vascular biologist by training, so I have some vascular biology uh, examples, but I nowadays also study cardiomyocytes, so I also have some uh, cardiac examples later. Anyway, um, so uh, several of these microRNAs always given a number, which is very convenient. Um, these microRNAs have been described in, for example, endothelial cells, but also smooth muscle cells. And you see always these inhibitory arrows where the microRNA inhibits the expression of the uh, target genes and thereby exerts its function. And usually they only describe one or two of these targets in these studies, but of course bear in mind that it can be over 100. So there's usually multiple targets that are being targeted um, by these microRNAs. Um, so uh, I mentioned that the microRNAs bind only partially complementary, so how does that then actually look? So here's an example of uh, a microRNA with uh, the mature microRNA, actually only 18 nucleotides, so a, a relatively small one. Normally they are 18 to 21 nucleotides. Um, and what you can see here is that nucleotide 2 to 8 is called the seed sequence. All right, so these seven nucleotides, they bind perfectly complementary to the target mRNA, which you can see over here. And actually, there can be a GU binding in RNA, but uh, you can uh, ignore that. Um, and if this uh, criterion is met, then the microRNA uh, can, in principle, uh, inhibit the expression of the uh, messenger RNA, which uh, you can see here by the mechanism that I depicted before. Usually, there's also some complementary binding in this side of the microRNA, but it's not uh, always completely necessary. And you can see below uh, one particular example of the microRNA called MIR92A. And it has been shown in this publication from 2010 that it can bind to the integrin alpha 5 uh, 3 prime UTR, so the messenger RNA 3 prime UTR of this gene. And you can see indeed that this part of the, of the microRNA binds fully complementary, even a little bit more than, this, than the seed sequence, and thereby inhibits the expression. But the same microRNA can also bind to, for example, uh, a gene called KLF2. 
uh, in the three prime UTR of this gene. <coughs> and you can also see that there's 100% complementarity uh, of at least uh, the seed sequence in this um, um, uh, of the microRNA with the three prime UTR of this gene. So indicating that already this one microRNA inhibits these two genes and probably many more. Um, so this is um, quite important because then here's an example of um, a vascular microRNA, or at least a microRNA which has uh, important vascular functions. As I said, I will have some vascular e examples. So this is one of them where microRNA 29 was studied. And what you can see here is that when you overexpress MIR29 in mice and you perform an aneurysm model, uh, what you see then is that uh, the uh, aneurysm worsens, so you have more widening of the aorta. Whereas if you inhibit microRNA 29B, you get a blockage of uh, aneurysm um, formation. Uh, and this is because um, microRNA 29 targets extracellular matrix protein. And if you have uh, in a normal uh, tissue relatively little microRNA 29, then all these extracellular matrix proteins can be expressed, and it targets several, several tens of them. Then you have a normal extracellular matrix, and therefore the aorta is normally intact. But if you ha go into a disease situation where you have more MIR29 expression, then actually uh, the extracellular matrix protein production is inhibited, so you have less extracellular matrix, and therefore the aorta, the aortic wall weakens, uh, and this uh, facilitates aneurysm formation. But when you then use an inhibitor of MIR29, in this case termed LNA29, then the, you inhibit the microRNA, you allow the uh, extracellular matrix proteins to be produced again, so you have a strong extracellular matrix, and this prevents aneurysm formation or amel uh, ameliorates aneurysm formation um, in, at least in mice. Um, so here's an example of how one single microRNA by targeting several mRNAs can actually have a, a very important uh, role in, in normal vascular biology. So then uh, to try to get you awake again at the end of the microRNA uh, part and to see who paid most attention, and uh, there's a quiz question. So how many microRNAs are present in the human genome? Um, and just by um, show of hands, so I will go through the answers first. So is it A, uh, more than 5,000, B, between uh, 2,000 and 5,000, C, between 100 and 2,000, or D, even less than 100? Um, so just by show of hands, who thinks uh, answer A is the right answer? Just show your hand, don't be shy. I will count if I see enough all of your hands. It's okay if you're wrong, it's fine, we're here to learn. So who thinks A is the right answer? No one, good. Or someone in the back, fine. <laughs> Very good, no, at least people raise their hands. So who thinks B is the right answer? Very good. And who thinks C is the right answer? Nice as well. Who thinks D is the right answer? Yeah, it's kind of a giveaway, right? Because I've shown the numbers already in uh, mere 145 or so. So D is not right, A is also not right, but most people said either B or C, and actually most people voted B. Um, and uh, this is the correct answer. So well done, you paid w attention very well. So I'm happy about that. But think about these numbers <laughs> for, uh, for a second. So there's about 2,500 microRNAs in the, in the human genome. This uh, number differs a little bit on depending on which uh, database you believe. Um, and if there's, say, about 500 targets per microRNA, maybe this is a bit of a high estimate, could be a little bit lower. But anyway, people think that m many microRNAs have about 500 targets, uh, target mRNAs. And if you multiply these numbers, you end up with 1.2 million target size uh, sites in uh, mRNAs, and of course we have only about 20,000, 25,000 genes, uh, indicating already that and there's many more target sites than we have genes. And actually it's true that about 75% of mRNAs is targeted by at least one microRNA or more. Obviously you can have multiple microRNAs binding to, to one gene. Uh, and there's also several mRNAs which are relatively short and somehow escape regulation by microRNAs. Maybe this is an evolutionary mechanism as well. Uh, so the, this uh, has to show you that, that actually almost all genes are under the influence of microRNA regulation. All right, so then we switch a little bit to the uh, longer non-coding RNAs, the link RNAs, um, and these are uh, particularly abundant in higher organisms, as I showed. This also accounts for the microRNAs, actually, um, and their expression can be uh, relatively tissue-specific. And as I said, on the sequence level, they are not so very well conserved. Uh, but the promoter region uh, usually is, because this depends on 
transcription factor binding that binds usually to uh, a, a certain a nucleotide sequence in, in mice and men and, and all the other organisms that you may want to look at. Uh, and usually there's no selection pressure then on the primary sequence as long as the structure of the, of the link RNA remains the same and it can bind the same proteins or actually even the same RNAs or even metabolites, uh, for, for all I know, uh, in uh, these organisms. But often the, um, the locus in which they are is conserved, and what I mean by that is depicted here on the bottom. So if you have in a human situation gene A on the left and gene B on the right of your link RNA, and you find in the mouse situation the homologue of gene A and the homologue of gene B, and in between there is a transcript, then it's very likely to be the, um, the homologue of the, the human transcript, even though they are maybe on the sequence level not very well conserved. And because this locus is nicely conserved, um, the, the function might well be conserved between those uh, RNAs. And like microRNAs, also long non-coding RNAs can be anywhere in the genome. So several have been described. They can be like um, intergenic, and, uh, and this is a special case of intergenic ones where they are bidirectional, so they, they share their promoter with, a, in this case, a protein coding mRNA. So they are regulated in the same way. Um, there can be uh, overlapping um, link RNAs with uh, normal messenger RNAs or even other link RNAs uh, in the sense direction um, and overlapping with an exon. So these are, these are exons, these are introns, by the way. And they can also be intronic, so within an intron of uh, messenger RNAs, for example, like the microRNAs could be. They can also be in the opposite strand of, um, of mRNAs, and usually these are termed then antisense uh, link RNAs. Um, maybe you've, you've seen them around in publications. And of course, there's the intergenic, which don't have anything to do, ha don't have any interaction with uh, surrounding genes. And then there's also a special kind of um, uh, link RNA, which is called the enhancer link RNAs or the enhancer RNAs, which actually the mere uh, uh, transcription activation of the enhancer already uh, induces the transcription of the mRNA they are close to. So you basically open the chromatin or start transcription here on the enhancer RNA, and this induces the transcription of the mRNA they are regulated. They are regulating, and these are usually only in the nucleus and only present in a, in a relatively a small chromatin region. Anyway, too, uh, too detailed, I think. Um, so uh, these uh, link RNAs can have various cellular functions, whereas for the microRNAs I've shown they are very specific in just inhibiting the uh, gene expression of, uh, of genes. Um, uh, link RNAs can basically do almost anything that proteins can do. Okay, so just by uh, being an RNA molecule in the cell, they can, for example, bind to transcription factors that would normally bind to double-stranded DNA. Double-stranded RNA looks a lot like double-stranded DNA, so you can fool transcription factors into binding the double-stranded RNA instead and thereby prevent the transcription factor from binding to the DNA. All right, so uh, several link RNAs have also been shown to sponge uh, microRNAs, so they bind microRNAs and therefore prevent the microRNA to, uh, to regulate the expression of their normal target mRNA. Um, they can be ribonuclear proteins, basically just bringing proteins together and making sure that protein A interacts with protein B. Interestingly enough, link RNAs have also been shown to interact directly with the DNA, um, and by this uh, effect, they can then recruit, for example, chromatin modifiers to the proper site in the genome, making sure the genes are turned on or turned off uh, based on uh, the lo uh, localization by the uh, link RNA. Uh, and most of this then takes place in the nucleus, of course, but in the, uh, in the cytoplasm, link RNAs can also bind um, to uh, mRNAs where they prevent a translation or splicing, which takes place in the nucleus again, uh, can be regulated by link RNAs, or they can regulate the degradation of the mRNA. So there are several examples of these link RNAs regulating several cellular processes. Basically, everything you can imagine uh, could actually be true for link RNAs. So here's a, a little bit more examples and a little bit more specific. Um, so for example, um, link RNAs can regulate editing of RNAs, and editing of an RNA is usually, at least A to I editing, uh, is done by an enzyme called ADAR, and this actually only binds to double-stranded RNA. So in this example, you can, uh, by having a link RNA binding to your mRNA, you can recruit ADAR in editing the mRNA and thereby changing the, uh, the function of the mRNA. 
Um, you can imagine that if a link RNA binds to an, uh, an exon-intron <coughs> junction, which would normally be recognized by the splice machinery to remove this, uh, this intron, if a link RNA masks that, uh, then the splicing doesn't take place. So then, uh, in this uh, example, a link RNA can control splicing. Um, there's also uh, examples of where the link RNA binds to the mRNA and prevents translation, as I've shown you or uh, where it regulates the um, stability of the mRNA, in this case by binding a protein called Staufen, which is well known to regulate stability of mRNAs or degradation of mRNAs. Um, and this is the uh, example of the uh, um, well, of microRNA sponging, uh, sort of. In this case, actually, it's a little bit different where the link RNA prevents the microRNA from binding the mRNA by binding to the mRNA and therefore the microRNA cannot bind, but uh, the effect is the same. Um, and finally, one, of one very interesting uh, thing uh, about microRNA sponges, there have been several circular RNAs described to inhibit microRNAs, and these circular RNAs are also thought to be non-coding, even though nowadays uh, some circles have been described to be also translated into protein. And these circular RNAs are very, very interesting and cool structures, I think, so we'll have two slides on that. Um, it's a little bit of a sidetrack, but um, this is how these circ RNAs are made. So they are usually made from normal protein coding genes. So now we're talking actually about those 3% of the genome that is actually protein coding, which turns out to also have non-coding functions, all right? Um, so um, what you see here is a normal um, mRNA with exon 1, intron 1, exon 2, intron 2, and so on, right? And normally these introns are nicely spliced out so that you have um, exon 1 is attached to 2, which is attached to 3, normal splicing. Um, but actually what happens in, uh, when circ RNAs are made is that you get a so-called back splicing, where, for example, this end of exon 3 gets spliced to this end, uh, to the beginning of exon 3. So you end up with a circular RNA like this, or you can even have back splicing over several exons, and then you get a circular RNA like this, and from this actually the intron can be spliced out again so that you get this. So it's a little bit uh, complicated, but it's just basically a byproduct of normal splicing. And people thought this was uh, non-functional uh, ages ago, but uh, nowadays people are, have, have been looking more closely at these circular RNAs and actually um, they, they seem to, to play a role in biology. And actually one of the uh, biggest genes that uh, some of you are probably familiar with in, in the human genome, which is called titan, uh, which has several exons. Uh, and of course, if you have more exons, then you are more likely to produce circular RNAs. And, and from titan uh, in this study in 2016, uh, several uh, of these link RNAs or circular RNAs have been described to arise from the, from the titan gene, either in humans or in mouse. So all of these lines stand for a back splicing event between uh, two different exons. So basically a more downstream exon back splicing to a more upstream exon, which normally shouldn't take place, but this produces circular RNAs. And as you can see from all these lines, there is many, many circular RNAs. Um, and these are even dependent on an RNA binding protein called RBM20, which normally regulates splicing of titan, as some of you are probably aware. Um, and um, they saw that if they don't have RBM20, that several of these circles are not produced, whereas others are present. What they do? Uh, we still don't know, at least on this example, there's no uh, real function described. They could sponge <coughs> microRNAs, for example, but they could also do um, lots of other things. Okay, so I've shown you that these link RNAs can, do, uh, can control various uh, cellular functions, but what are then the tools that you can use to study them, or uh, how can you uh, interfere with them um, uh, therapeutically? Of course, this is all preclinical pre work, um, but um, at least it's, uh, it's possible to interfere with them um, therapeutically. Uh, anyway, they look uh, a lot like mRNA, so you can use more or less the same tools as you would want if you would want to uh, regulate mRNA levels. Um, so because many of them are actually polyadenylated, uh, some of them are actually localized to the nucleus, many, but not always, which is... Uh, another barrier if you want to target them therapeutically because you have to enter the nucleus of cells, of course. And of course, there's no uh, open reading frame because they're non-coding. Non and when a, a link RNA is localized in the nucleus, uh, you can use so-called GAPMIRs. And these are very interesting molecules. They are uh, also very short, 16 nucleotides normally, um, and they are anti-sense to the link RNA that you want to inhibit. Um, and they consist of um, three nucleotides of LNA. So these are artificial uh, uh, nucleotides. I'll show in the next slide a little bit more in detail. 
and then a stretch of DNA and then LNA again. And this stretch of DNA that hybridizes them with your mRNA, is a, so this produces a DNA-RNA hybrid. And this is recognized by an enzyme called RNase H, which is naturally present in the nucleus, and you can exploit this nicely uh, because it will then de degrade your uh, link RNA that you want to target, or your mRNA. And of course, this only works well for transcripts that remain uh, sufficiently long in the nucleus, and some of the link RNAs do. So that's something that uh, the link RNAs are very, uh, um, say, proficient in, uh, in being targeted by this um, uh, strategy. But of course, when they are in the cytoplasm, then you could try to also use GAPMIRs as long as they remain in the nucleus for long enough. Or, of course, as iRNAs, and, uh, and this is a whole different uh, field of delivering functional as iRNAs into cells to target uh, RNAs, and I won't go into detail. But, for example, you can, uh, you can um, put as iRNAs in, in nanoparticles and, uh, and deliver them in, um, in vivo and so that they remain a little bit uh, active a little bit longer in vivo. Um, so these are some of the strategies that you could use to target um, uh, link RNAs uh, therapeutically. Um, and I, as I said, I, I wanted to go a little bit more into detail on these gap mirrors. So they consist of these LNA nucleotides at the end and DNA in the middle. And these LNAs are artificial nucleotides. So they have this sort of bridge that you see here. And that's why they're called LNA, because it stands for locked nucleic acid. So they have this sort of locked configuration. And of course, this makes them uh, resistant to nucleases because it doesn't get recognized by RNAs, DNAs, or whatever, because it's artificial, right? So it it's remains in the cell for a, for a relatively long time. But it also induces the affinity for the target that they, uh, that they are uh, antisense to. So they bind more specifically and better to the target uh, RNA that you want to bind. So these are very interesting uh, molecules that, that increase the efficiency and efficacy of these, uh, of these cap mirrors. And that they can actually be used uh, potentially uh, in clinic, uh, in the clinic has been shown in this study where they used gap mirrors against uh, uh, an mRNA actually, PCSK9, probably very familiar to uh, many of you. Um, so uh, inhibiting PCSK9 is interesting because it reduces um, um, lipids in the circulation um, and therefore it's, uh, it's considered as a, another therapy next to, for example, statins to, uh, to reduce um, lipids. Um, so um, cholesterol. Um, and what, have been shown, what has been shown in this um, example is that when they used gap mirrors against PCSK9 in monkeys, then they could effectively reduce uh, PCSK9 protein levels in the serum uh, at the highest concentration that they used, and, then, uh, and it was relatively safe in monkeys. And of course, this can then uh, be translated relatively quickly to the human situation. Um, all right, so then another example of uh, another link RNA that, uh, or a link RNA that regulates uh, vascular function in this case, uh, which is called uh, MALAD1, which is one of the um, um, earliest described link RNAs. Um, it's been shown to localize in, in the nucleus, in nuclear speckles actually, actually, and it is relatively highly sequence conserved uh, in mammals, which is interesting because normally link RNAs are not. Uh, and therefore, there's also a high interest already since decades in this uh, link RNA. But actually, the knockout mice show no apparent phenotype on the normal physiological um, conditions. Of course, it's called metastasis-associated lung adenocarcinoma transcript 1. That's what the abbreviation stands for. So, of course, there's so it has something to do with cancer. But in, in normal physiology, the mice are fine. And what you can see in, uh, in, in, in situ hybridization here in zebrafish is if you're a vascular biologist, uh, you, you would say that uh, you would find vessels here. So these are perhaps the intersomitic vessels that are stained in the, uh, in the zebrafish, even though the original paper described it as brain-specific. But it is actually present in endothelium. It's actually present in a lot of cells. So we decided to, um, back in 2014, to, dis to look at uh, what MALAD1 does in endothelial cells. And we found that when we silenced uh, MALAD1 and used uh, an endothelial functional model, where we basically just make endothelial cells into a ball and have them sprout out, so make new uh, tiny blood vessels uh, into a matrix. When we silenced MALAD1, we found that this worked better. Okay, so we thought, okay, this is good. So silencing MALAD1 induces uh, angiogenesis, at least in this model. Um, and when we then um, also, when we then use the migration assay, so where you just basically have cells cultured in a, in a, in a plastic dish, you scratch them away and allow the cells to grow back we saw that uh, silencing MALAD1 also induces migration. So 
okay, maybe this can be uh, used as an angiogenesis therapy or something like that, we thought. But we also saw that when we silence MELA1, proliferation is reduced. And of course, if you want to induce endothelial angiogenesis, you also want to induce proliferation. Uh, and actually, this was, um, was gone when we silenced uh, MELA1, so that we concluded that MELA1 normally induces proliferation, but silence uh, reduces migration. And to test this a little bit further, we decided to stimulate these, these pharaohs that we had in the previous slide with VEGF to ha allow them to, ma to make maximal amount of sprouts, so to maximally perform angiogenesis. And in the control cells, this works relatively well because you see all these sprouts going out of these spheroids. But what you see when we silence MELA1, these tip cells, so the cells that grow away from the, uh, from the spheroid, they are migrating like crazy because we silence MELA1. However, the cells that should follow to make a real sort of a primitive blood vessel, uh, they are lacking because they cannot proliferate, right? Um, so if you then quantify all these gaps in, the, in these vessels, then you see indeed that this is, and that you induce all those gaps when you silence melat one. So it's probably not good to induce angiogenesis uh, in case uh, in vivo. So we decided to test this in the actual knockout mice that didn't appear to have a, a very good, uh, didn't appear to have a normal phenotype. Um, but when we looked at the retina, so when a mouse gets born, it has no blood vessels in the eye, um, and it's blind, but then after, during the uh, first week, so to say, uh, after birth, the blood vessels um, sort of colonize the, uh, the retina, and that's what you see here. So in, uh, this is basically just um, an entire retina of one mouse eye, and you can, uh, can really nicely look at the, the, the blood vessels there. So this is a very good angiogenesis model. And what we saw is that uh, this, this outgrowth from the center uh, towards the periphery is already reduced when we silence MELAD1, and also the density of, uh, of blood vessels is reduced when we silence MELAD1. And of course we thought, no, this must be due to uh, reduced proliferation, even though they should migrate more, but if they can't proliferate, this doesn't work. And indeed, we saw that proliferation is reduced when we uh, silence uh, MELAD1 in, or in these knockout mice indicating that, this, uh, that without melat one the endothelial cells cannot proliferate enough uh, to perform normal vascularization. So again, a non-coding RNA, melat one definitely does not code for protein, um, but it has a function in controlling proliferation of endothelial cells, and you, if you don't have it, endothelial cells don't proliferate that well. Um, and another uh, very interesting link RNA, which is called ANRIL, is actually causally linked to atherosclerosis in a, a, a GWAS uh, study. So uh, what they saw is that um, patients with uh, this haplotype, uh, the uh, four times G haplotype, uh, in uh, this, uh, so basically this SNP in, in the non-coding RNA ANRIL, that these uh, patients have a more uh, pro-atherogenic uh, phenotype. Um, and what they attributed this to is that, of course, these are more uh, elaborate studies, is that um, actually ANRIL binds uh, epigenetic regulators, so the PRC1 and PRC2 complex, and thereby regulating uh, target gene expression, making sure that some targets are expressed and some are not. And based on this SNP, you, have a, a, you are more prone to develop atherosclerosis um, or not. So again, this is just a, a non-coding RNA. It does not get translated into protein, but these... Uh, but a, a, a functional haplotype um, in this uh, link RNA determines how susceptible you are to atherosclerosis. So I've talked about these non-coding RNAs all the time, but apparently some of these transcripts that are annotated as link RNAs are not non-coding. So they actually code for protein. So it's actually mRNAs that have been misclassified. So this is something that you have to take into account when you study link RNAs. Uh, because they have basically not well been well annotated, and this is a, a, a study by the uh, the Olson lab in the in the U.S. Uh, where they looked at this li link RNA called Link 00948, and it has a mouse homolog with an even more obscure name. But they looked uh, into into detail, and they found that even though this RNA is very small, it's only 430 base pairs, 427. Uh, which is very small for a normal mRNA, it has a very small open reading frame. It actually gets translated into protein, and this is not a, uh, a non-coding RNA. It's actually uh, an mRNA, which produces a very tiny protein. So this is one of the confounders in, in non-coding RNA research, and they call this uh, open uh, reading frame, they called MLN, Meyer regulin, and they went on to show that this is expressed in, in skeletal muscle mainly, and if they... Um, 
mutate the start codon of this small open reading frame, then they uh, don't find this uh, protein anymore. So indicating that it's really this small open reading frame that gets translated into this uh, tiny protein of only f five kilo delta that is important for muscles. All right, so we should keep that in mind that some of these link RNAs are actually translated <coughs> into protein. And there's actually a rel relatively uh, recent uh, paper, this came only online about two weeks ago, but I thought I'd share it with you anyway, which is a, a group from Berlin um, who um, basically uh, took advantage of uh, ribosome profiling. So what they did uh, is uh, they took, uh, took hearts of, uh, of many uh, patients and controls and they did ribosome profiling and took, taking advantage of uh, basically that you have RNAs that are bound by ribosomes, but these ribosomes can also protect parts of the RNA where they bind. And we know that ribosomes always um, go along RNAs in sort of this triplet conformation, right? Because it has to recognize triplets with the tRNA in there, if you remember from the beginning. And so this periodicity, you can uh, exploit this to see whether an RNA is actually uh, being uh, translated by ribosomes or not. And that's what they did. Um, so what you see here is uh, basically of um, the, the first 100 nucleotides of all the microRNA, uh, messenger RNA open reading frames that they uh, found translated. And you see is that they get much more signal uh, from the first nucleotide than they get from nucleotide two and three, as you can see here. So this is this periodicity that uh, ribosomes use when they go over RNAs when they get translated. And it only happens uh, when they are translated because when you look just before the open reading frame, you don't see this periodicity. So you can use this information to predict whether uh, an mRNA or a non-coding RNA or whatever gets translated into protein um, or not. And they found, uh, so to make this long story relatively short, uh, they found that of the sort of 800 uh, link RNAs that they studied in the human heart, so these are only 800 of the 30,000, but still, that they found that uh, 169 they could uh, detect uh, small peptides. And so they uh, predicted by their algorithm and actually could confirm some of them. So that, and this is 22%, so that 22% of the, uh, the non-coding RNAs or transcripts that are annotated as non-coding RNA are actually protein coding. So this is um, something we, uh, at least myself and my colleagues in the non-coding RNA field should consider that indeed, even though 78% of the non-coding RNAs is still non-coding, 22% may be uh, coding. All right. Um, so <laughs> finally, um, the, this slide is just to make you think about why we shouldn't be surprised that we find RNA uh, functioning as an RNA and not as a, as a protein or not gets translated as a protein because there's actually the hypothesis that life started with RNA, sort of this is the, the RNA world uh, hypothesis. Uh, where it uh, has been shown that RNA can actually do um, so many things and that uh, when life started, we only had RNA and only later protein and DNA came into play. So maybe something to, to realize when you study uh, um, RNA in, in cells. Um, all right, so this was uh, my presentation. And the home take home message of today is that you should, that not only protein coding genes are important for the cardiovascular system. So I hope you remember that. Um, and uh, I'm open for any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. A very nice overview and very clear overview of the complexity of the non-coding RNAs. I was even surprised for the last cell paper. So, no. uh, question, oh, plenty. If not, I also have some. Hi, thank you for a nice presentation. Uh, I have a question about this, the last part of your talk, about these uh, linker RNAs that are actually coding for small peptides. Do you think that they still have a role? as a non-coding RNA, so that you have two roles, at the, the yeah. RNA and the peptide. Yeah, that's a very uh, important point because that's actually what the, the authors themselves also point out because many of these link RNAs have also a, or not many, but some of the link RNAs that they describe have a very well uh, characterized non-coding role. And they also say that it still can still function as a non-coding RNA. Um, and um, so that you can have basically one molecule produces and a peptide which had does something and uh, performs a function as a, as a non-coding RNA. So this is very well, well possible. And they actually, um, yeah, in their discussion, they, they put this forward as uh, how complex biology actually, uh, actually is, yes. 
So, so you need to find good ways to distinguish between the two mechanisms. What is the RNA and what is the peptide? Yeah. What so in and one of the things is that, um, and I've shown that also in this uh, slide, what you can do is, of course, you can just mutate the, uh, the start codon. So you prevent the protein from being made, but the RNA is actually still present. So if you still have a function with uh, a mutated stop codon, then it's the RNA. If you lose ma your complete phenotype, then obviously it's only the, the, the protein. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> Thank you for the nice overview. So I have a question about um, how these RNAs are, uh, like, what kind of present in other species? So in, we know, like, this in mammals, but if you want to study them in more detail, can you also, like, how are they in, um, for example, zebrafish or other organisms? Is it the same, or how yeah, can so you study zebrafish them? Zebrafish is already a problem for many link RNAs, um, but there are... Uh, several link RNAs with homologs in, uh, in zebrafish, but there's also uh, many link RNAs that are called primate specific, so that you cannot even study them in, in mice. For micro RNAs, that's a, uh, a little bit better, so they are relatively well conserved uh, across uh, many species, so most of them are also present in zebrafish. Uh, but for link RNAs, this is um, a problem because either the link RNAs are definitely not, so basically if you have a human link RNA that you want to study in a zebrafish model, uh, it can be that they are, the link RNA is not there, or that it is there, but we don't uh, know which one of the transcripts it actually is because there's no sequence conservation, maybe the locus is not so well conserved between those species, and it could still be that there's a, a functional link RNA there, but you don't actually know which transcript it is, so that's, that's a big problem, but... Um, there's also no easy solution for that. Thanks. Hi, thanks for your talk. So I have a question. The, um, uh, yesterday we saw a lot of uh, pedigrees of heart function and myosin uh, mutations and everything of families with one mutation that affects the, the whole family. So is this also known for microRNAs or long non-coding RNAs that there are families with a certain mutation which have a certain phenotype? To my knowledge, not, no, especially in the cardiovascular system, I have n never seen an example. Maybe in another field, like oncology or whatever, there, there, there's an example, but uh, not that I'm aware of, no. But uh, do you think they exist, or is it just that the effect is not so clear that you would see it in, in such a pedigree? That's a philosophical <laughs> question. Uh, <laughs> of course, if you have an, a mutation in the, in the seed sequence of a microRNA, for example, this can have big effects. Um, but there's other mutations that could have smaller effects uh, if it's further away from the seed sequence, for example. Thank you. Uh, for microRNA, for example, uh, do you think it is more appropriate to use a local administration or a systemic administration, for mm. example, in vascular aging, depending of cell populations? Uh, depends a lot on which microRNA, because several of them are also cell type specific. Um, so then you can use a local uh, or a systemic uh, inhibition, and, but you still target only uh, locally the cells. But several of them are also very uh, abundant in, uh, in several cell types. And of course, then if you want to achieve an effect, say, only in cardiomyocytes or only in smooth muscle cells, for example, in the example that I showed of the uh, aneurysms, <coughs> then local application is, of course, very much um, uh, preferred, especially because with the example of MIR-29, if you inhibit MIR-29, you also induce fibrosis uh, in maybe other organs like the heart, which you don't want. Oh. Uh, so sorry, but we need to move on just because of the sake of time. Thank you so much. So we'll move